upgraded moderator. This is what I believe. Um, I was a speaker until an hour ago, and uh, Terry and Samir, because of the long time friendship we have, he said, I need you because he, he managed to get a new super amazing speaker. So um, first of all, I, I, wanna, I wanna give a chance to all our speakers to give us a sense of what they do and how is it linked to this topic of youth. And, uh, and then uh, we get uh, a deep dive into the conversation and, uh, and have, have, a, have a super insightful half an hour together. Thank you very much. And I would love to start with Juliana. Tell us about you and tell us how your work is related to the topic. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. My name is Juliana Lindsay. I'm the UNICEF representative here in Rwanda. Um, and we're working on a large global program called Generation Unlimited, which essentially aims to make sure that every young person is either in education, in employment, or in training in some form or fashion. And almost more importantly, to make sure that young people have a voice, that they have an opportunity to participate in decisions that affect their lives. So that's here in Rwanda with the Ministry of Youth and Culture, and it's in many other countries around the world. Love it. That, that was one minute. Eliani. Thank you, Ilya. So I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. When I was 17, I made a vow to myself to help give a voice to the voiceless. So I, in the first part of my career, I was a diplomat, and I left that. And, and now I'm advocating uh, against child sex, uh, sexual abuse and child sex trafficking. So I've been working in India. And right now, I'm a doctoral student at Harvard. Terrific. Thank you. Sanskriti. Hi. Uh, I'm Sanskriti Dabli. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Thinkabell Labs. Uh, we make education inclusive by building uh, technology uh, for Braille literacy, uh, helping children learn Braille remotely all over the world. Thank you. Excellent. We need more early childhood education. Andres. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrei Chush. I'm coming from Slovenia. I would start so. All began in 2005 when I was with one of my older colleagues. We were cleaning the bar because we both were waiters. And then he said, Andrei, we need someone young like you to be at a school student union at our uh, uh, middle school, gymnasium. <laughs> and then I said, okay, fine, I have time, I don't know what to do. And seven years later, I was the youngest mem member of the parliament in my country. Uh, until this year, June, I was state secretary. And now, uh, of course, we left the office. And uh, everything I achieved in politics, I achieved through youth work and youth sector. And that's my passion. I'm finishing my PhD on analysis of uh, youth infrastructure in European Union and especially my country and what to do. And uh, I'm really happy and honored to be here with you. Terrific. And, and I think this is the, the next few minister of, of youth in his country. So watch out. Um, Juliana, I would love to start with you, and uh, I know that over the last two decades, uh, what has changed in terms of global priorities for youth? What are the new challenges that are emerging for young people, uh, both related to the pandemic? I know we spoke a lot about the, about the pandemic, but that's an important, I think, turning point for, for, for youth topics. Can you, yeah, can you tell us what legacy issues and what, what remain to be uh, achieved? Thank you. I'll share a couple of things. One in particular around with a young woman today, just this afternoon, who was talking to me about the trauma that young people are experiencing. And I asked her what kind of trauma she was talking about. And she gave the example of, you know, well, if someone says, hey, I can help you get a scholarship, and they connect with you on WhatsApp or on something else, and then you go to see them and you realize they want more than just the scholarship. And so these are challenges that 20 years ago when we weren't online didn't necessarily exist in the same way. It's not that they weren't there, but online access makes things much larger and in some ways just more secretive. I saw in the news just this morning that I think it's Snapchat that's now going to allow parents to see what other people, their children on Snapchat are talking to, which is good because children need the guidance and the supervision of their parents. Um, so there's huge, don't get me wrong, there's huge potential of the digital world. I think there's incredible things that technology can do, but we also have to be vigilant because young people are dealing with challenges that people in other generations didn't have to deal with. Yeah. And, and that's, that's linked to a little bit to what you've been discussing in your, in your uh, earlier uh, uh, presentation. So, 
So how, how is, how is can, can you give me a sense of the work you do uh, and, and, and link it to uh, Juliana? Yes, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I actually am a member of Twitter's Trust and Safety Council. So we actually advised, um, advised the company like Jack Dorsey before he stepped down um, on child online safety, so products before they get rolled out and things like that. I'm a survivor myself, I've shared that story with you. And I work with other survivors to tell their stories. Uh, but what we come across um, you know, with the work that we do is that it's, it's actually very inimical, it's very difficult. And a lot of the work that's happening online is a very new territory. Only the government of Ukraine uh, that I know of has been doing holistic work on digital protection for children. Um, Scotland is doing something like that as well, but there's nothing that's overarching in any of the governments that, uh, uh, in the world. Um, so only some very small aspects. Can I just share one thing there? Uh, absolutely. If you don't mind, you said we could jump in. I, I'm really happy that in Rwanda also, there's a child online protection policy okay. that the government of ICT and innovation has done with the Ministry of Gender and, and Family Promotion. It still needs some work on implementation, um, but I just wanted to share that there's a little bit here as well. Great, it's really great to hear. Yeah. They cannot both of helping or increasing the, the challenges or how, how technology, can you give us a, a sense of where technology is helping and where technology is not helping? I could come in first. So uh, when I was working with the Nobel laureate Kalasa Yati Children's Foundation in India, I was working with Interpol, and they told me quite frankly that uh, only 32 countries have the capabilities to deal with uh, child uh, sexual exploitation material. Uh, and so, for example, just to give like a, a, a like a, some information, there's 50,000 such images of children online every month that comes out, new pictures. So you can actually try, and what you do is try to ID every photo. But what, what, the, the, what the, the perpetrators would try to do then is to you know, resize it or do something with it. So when you change the ID, you get another new picture altogether. So the best thing is not to post pictures of children in positions where they can be used and, and to, to create new pictures that are lewd. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult, it becomes, it's a very difficult topic. I just wanna share a positive example, for, for, if I may, because there are also wonderful ways that technology can help. If you look at education, for example, in addition, I really wanna hear your, your story about the, the Braille opportunities, but also during COVID, there were kids who, if we didn't have technology, they would not have been able to continue learning. That's not the whole picture. There are also a lot of young people who didn't have access, who didn't have the data, who didn't have a device at home. And so the challenge is to, to make that gap smaller so that all children have access to be able to continue education. Yeah. Hopefully we don't have more lockdowns yeah. like we did before, but it is a demonstration that at least some children were able to keep up and we have to make sure all children can do that. I'd love to deep dive into the education experience later on. I'm just, I just wanna, I'd love to hear the, the the voice of an entrepreneur who is, you're, for the past eight years, you've been dreaming to be, to create the product you have created. Yeah. And, and this is a product that is working directly with young people. So you're focused on early childhood education. Yeah. Um, give us a sense of, and I'm in education, I know that if you start in early childhood education, you could fix a lot of problem along the way. So give us a sense of how important it is to, to have the right you know, uh, solutions uh, and, and, and you know, the right start with, with, uh, with, with, with education at that early age. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Elias. So uh, I'll start by saying, I mean, the importance of early childhood education or intervention or literacy at its most fundamental level. Uh, if we take a look around this room right now, or even on this panel, uh, what are we, 60% women? Yeah. And engage meaningfully, but uh, it, things like scientific temper and values and whatnot. So a lot of those things are at the foundation, uh, you know, something that we as, as a society provide in school. And so it, it really matters who is not in the room right now, because whoever was not in my classroom when I was in school is not in the room with me today. And that is what we need to fix. So uh, just sharing uh, a bit more about our products. So, uh, we make technology to enable braille learning and uh, how that is different is it, it's, it enables anyone to teach braille. So braille learning is not limited to uh, you know, the, the, the privileged few who have access to personal tutors, but it's a scalable solution that can uh, work in an inclusive education setup. And India is adopting the national education policy um, 
now, which, uh, which means that every school will be an inclusive school. And being one seventh of the world, you know, adopting something like inclusive education as a policy is huge because it, it affects who participates in society, it affects uh, our own relationships, friendships, things like that, and our own perspective also being surrounded by uh, people. I think, I think uh, I, I'm picking women again because that's a very relatable topic. If you grew up in a classroom surrounded by people of both sexes versus if you didn't, it really uh, changes the way you see the world. So uh, that's why it's really important to sort of invest early. Yeah. And I think as a principle, as a society, we've been doing it. But with the most recent difficulties that the world has been facing, like the pandemic, I think that's why technology is critical. And I, I won't say, it, I mean, it's not like technology is good or it's bad. It's merely a medium. So who is using the tech and what are they trying to do with it? Yeah. That, that's all that matters at the end. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I like that. And, and again, I want to I wanna spend a bit of time later about just education. But just I want to I wanna move to, so, so now we're five years from now. We're in the future. You are a minister. Yes. Uh, I, want, I want to hear the minister how he thinks about putting together meaningful policy for you know, young people to, to create better conversation and just to echo some of the conversation I've been hearing. We need uh, a new direction for the world. And, and right now I feel like we're lost, right? Where do we go and where you ask, you know, how do we regather young people to reimagine their future? A good question, and I must admit that I fully Still preparing agree. you for your career. That's oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> Something I just finished, but okay. <laughs> um, a bit of uh, fun. Uh, let's see. So, um, yesterday and today, there was a lot of things that said that things in European Union are not well. Well, I would agree with them because uh, we forgot what means partnership, what means cooperation. And I think that uh, one great speaker from uh, Rwanda government spoke about that, uh, and it maybe touched me a little. Uh, and uh, when we are talking about youth participation, uh, all the polit politics and po uh, politicians, they want to create youth politics from up bottom. You are strengthening your own position, and you don't allow young people who have a free mind, who are motivated and uh, educated that want to change something you know even if you ask me 10 years ago when i was member of the parliament i was you know make prepared to make revolution maybe now 10 years later when i'm married i'm a bit more calmer because wife say so um, but uh, things is that first you have to make field where young people will feel well will be uh, uh, will feel that's their home and that will, they not will be scared to tell anything. And if you create youth politics from bottom up, then I think that's a long-term stories. Short-term stories are up bottom, financed with a lot of money, but with no effects. And when you create youth sector based, that was also Slovenia. We were part of Yugoslavia. We got independent. And I would say that youth young movement in 80s, late 80s, then there were greens, there were punk, rock, and such a subcultures that uh, the former leadership, they didn't know how to respond to that, you know? And with that, uh, we opened society, we opened, uh, you could say something against, you know, the government. And now we are, you know, last year we were presiding the European Union uh, as a country of two million people, and that was a unique experience for me. And I was very honored. And uh, f when young people, they can change, but first uh, the world, but we must make feel for them where they will f feel well and uh, sky is the limit. And every euro or dollar or how you say invested, you know, we are young, we have to work, but you also have to party, you have to play football, everything. You have to do everything in your life because if you don't do that until 30 or 40, then you will do that later and that's not good. <laughs> How do you, if you look at all these established platforms, the Commonwealth, the Francophonie, the G20, how meaningfully young people could have, you know, a, a, a better, a better, you know, 
place within these platform. Uh, can, can, can you enumerate some, some suggestion that, and I, and I, know, I, know, I know folks here are gonna host the G20 uh, soon, so, so yeah. When we are talking about youth sector, I think uh, when I was critical of EU, but still the young youth sector in European Union, that's one of the brightest sites currently, because European Youth Forum is making an amazing job by promoting freedom rights, uh, activism, participation, and uh, so on. Uh, and there are many good changes. And I see, if you ask me, after 15 years in youth sector politics, I miss some international cooperation, you know, that Africa, Europe, uh, the states, Arab world that would cooperate and create one uh, international platform. Maybe that's like you would say I'm dreaming, but uh, if we want to change and live like uh, Samir said yesterday, uh, global governance, then we will have to start not just thinking, but also doing like that. Actually, the, the thing is, I believe a lot of young people, they are talking together, but not in the established platforms. And that, that, that's a challenge. We, we need to get those conversations that are happening on internet that we don't have access to, by the way. We need to get to know, hey, what's happening? What, what are the conversations? Maybe we need to listen a little bit more. Uh, Juliana, I'm going back to education. During the pandemic, and I think I'm just going to repeat the numbers, about 1.6 uh, a huge number of, of out of kids didn't get access to, to normal schooling. Uh, and in a way that, that kind of highlighted the opportunities linked to technology, and for once EdTech became a hot topic, where many years before the pandemic, no one, no one wanted to hear anything about EdTech. Now people are you know, looking at how do we implement EdTech. In your organization, and, and think, you, you, you know, you, you link to, 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 uh, to young people. How, how do you see the, this kind of new kids on the block and, 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 and new way of learning uh, and, and so on? I think the lesson we've really learned, in fact, our, our regional offices did some analysis of ed tech throughout the continent. And the conclusion was essentially that we need blended learning. The technology can provide a huge, be a huge accelerator it can help us reach more people. It can provide different ways of learning. It can give access to languages, for example, that one would not have access to. It gives access to all of the Coursera, the Khan Academy, et cetera. But we can't just leave young people on their own and say, here's a device and here's the internet and go off and do it by yourselves. It's got to be linked with a real live human being, a teacher. It's got to be linked with peer learning so that kids can work with each other. And that has real potential, especially when we look at population growth on the continent. The number of young people is not getting smaller, it's getting bigger. It's going to be challenging for countries to simply build enough schools, to simply train enough teachers. So if we can combine the benefits of technology with the human interaction so that kids can ask questions, so they can have discussion groups with their colleagues, um, partly in person, partly online, there's real potential there to be able to make incredible progress, but it's not one or the other. Yeah. I, 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 see, I see you like, oh yeah, I'm gonna jump to you for this question. <laughs> what can you add? I, I agree with everything you said, because uh, again, coming to, to Braille, people are like, oh, you know, Braille, uh, people have Alexa now or whatever. It, it's never really one or the other. And specifically, I think where technology works best is where existing systems have failed to reach. That is truly where uh, the right tech can make the right impact. But uh, again, the, the, the human element is so critical because I, uh, at least in early childhood education or literacy, uh, the, the way you learn a language is so different. It is not simply translated from one language to another. So if I'm learning English and I'm learning A for apple, B for ball, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not going to learn the same objects when I'm learning another language, like say Hindi. So uh, you, you're not going to say so say seb. That 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 does not work. So the very local contexts in which uh, education is actually delivered, and which is why it's it's not like a one size fits all sort of solution. So uh, technology, and the human factor, uh, because the human factor is what brings that localization and contextualization, which is so critical. Uh, with, children and yeah. young people, I feel, yeah. 
Eliani, uh, earlier before coming into the room, we spoke about the, you know, the old kind of patriarchal type of uh, mentalities we still have and uh, you know, so, so some uh, dominating kind of, uh, uh, you know, race or, or how this is affecting, you know, the, the progress that you're trying to push and, 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 and how you can get, you know, get people to, you know, change those mul mul kind of a little bit of a cultural uh, uh, complication and, and yeah. Yeah, I think patriarchy is really, uh, it's everywhere. It's, it's all around us. Uh, so when I work with survivors, um, you know, if other survivors of child sexual abuse, we get told, oh, let sleeping dogs lie, um, let the past hurts go by, it, it, you know, just get over it. And that's really difficult because you know, as women, we get told over and over again, oh, you just need to get educated, you have economic agency, you, you will heal eventually from the trauma. That's not true. We basically have to dismantle patriarchy and, and deal with the toxic nature of that kind of system and what it means for survivors. And when I mean survivors too, it's not just women, it's all genders because people of all genders do get um, brutalized and, and attacked uh, for, 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 for what they are. So for me, I've been writing a lot about feminist foreign policy, and it's kind of odd to bring it in right now. But feminism is really about protecting the rights of women and girls and marginalized people. And so if we can actually apply feminist principles to our lives, to all aspects of policy making, I think we can make a real dent in how we, we look at the world. It's no point looking now at this current paradigm because we are in this right now. We need to basically get out of this paradigm and move to a different one. And I think feminism will help us get there. The word itself is problematic. I think we can talk about that. But the principles, I think, is, is really, really, really crucial to understand and apply in our lives. I want to move back to skills and, and, and education. Um, if, if, if we have to right now reform education, there is a lot of uh, focus right now on digital skills and, and you know, just massive investment into this. But is that the solution for the long term? Are, aren't we creating kind of, aren't we creating a solution for the sh short term, but we're kind of pushing uh, uh, the, the, the problem for later on. Are we ready for a more comprehensive and, and kind of strategy to rethink uh, uh, the education for, for, you know, from, from early childhood all the way to, you know, higher ed and, and lifelong learning? Where are we with, with, with our definition of education? I'll start with you. I think, I think that education field is way too rigid to respond quickly. And that's why it's happening what's happening. We are learning, uh, I would say in my country, we learn old people how to use Facebook, you know, but we all know that Facebook is already out of mode, you know. Uh, but still, it's okay. Uh, I think that uh, being active citizen, I would say on my point, uh, when I was president of the school student organization, I had to learn project management, rhetorics, I had to learn accounting, at the age of 20, imagine. And uh, uh, if we ask uh, 20 years old people today what they are thinking about that, they would say uh, TikTok and uh, maybe something else. I don't agree, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will listen uh, uh, very carefully. But um, uh, definitely the whole education field was, uh, I think, in living in uh, another world. And they forgot that outside is happening something else, and that's digital revolution. And I agree that we have to learn digital skills, but I would also try to teach people something about safety on internet and digital skills, because nothing is spoken about that. And we all say, that's good, we are making progress. But I would say, as a citizen or a, as a politician, uh, social media, 80% I dislike, 20% I like. And uh, maybe I think that's general opinion. And, and on the other side, we have to teach young people also something about um, finances, because that's a big problem today and an issue. And of course, uh, about uh, green thinking, I think. Uh, many will say you, you are born green, but uh, I think uh, time for that is past. I really like the, the, 
the global citizenship dimension, the financial literacy dimension, and the environment dimension. And I think if we, if we get that into our education system today, I think we can fix uh, many problems. I'd love to hear all of you about, on this question about just dreaming of reforming education that is a bit more realistic to, to the context we live in, uh, Saskriti. So, uh, I, <laughs> I think education as such has already escaped the institutions and that's what the internet really opened up. Uh, I'm a computer science engineer, but I started my company straight out of college. I don't have a business education background, but that didn't hold me back because I had access to, I don't know, like Udacity and uh, books and things like that. And I think that access is becoming way more democratized. The amount of free information available widely on the internet is, uh, is such that education is not limited to your colleges and universities or schools anymore. It's, it's most out there. So what we need to do, I think, as a society is to sort of broaden our own perspective on what education means. It's not a degree. It's, uh, I think that, that, that is happening uh, quite a lot where, uh, you know, governments are focusing on skilling and employability and things like that, thereby acknowledging that there is something beyond traditional education that sort of connects the dots uh, between, you know, your piece of paper, your degree, and then what actually gets you money uh, because of what trade you do. Uh, so in the future, I think it's going to be even more hybrid. It's not going to be, okay, let us modernize this institution to account for, uh, you, you know, um, digital transformation, but more about let's expand the defi definition of what that institution entails, um, bringing more legitimacy to uh, programs outside of traditional institutions. But that said, at the core of it, the basic concepts, and I really like what you said, Arliani, about, again, feminism. It's a loaded word, but uh, the, the principle of inclusion and, um, you know, ensuring that everyone uh, is accounted for and designed for and thought about at the core of it. I think that's very critical, no matter what the future of education holds, because there's nothing we can say here that, that's going to remotely resemble what ha actually happens 30, 40 years later, because the pace with which the world is changing is, is incredibly fast, and that, that's not just technology I'm talking about, the, the whole, I don't know, geopolitical landscape, the health situation, pandemics going left, right, center. Our life is changing very quickly, and what is true today may not be true six months from now, may not be true three years from today. So it's so important to sort of get your basic principles right, which brings me back into like things like inclusion, literacy, uh, and most importantly, like access, I think as long as these three things are held together, then no matter what form that education ultimately takes, as long as the principles are right, the world will move on, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask you a question specifically about accreditation and certification later on, so think about some <laughs> point, but I wanna hear this, this dream of reform, uh, yeah. I want to build upon what um, Sanskriti you said earlier, democratization of education. I think that it's so critical to actually make sure that there's representation, people of brown, and black people of color in this room, for example. You want to make sure that when you open a, a textbook, there is somebody who represents you, who looks like you as a child, or even now, in, for me, in academia. And so, for example, right now, when you look at first authors, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in global health, you look at first authors who are, who, because a lot of research is being done on this continent, but how many first authors are actually from here? And you look at the numbers, it's actually very appalling. Uh, during COVID, it, it just, 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 just by gender, and this is very binary, this is what I was given, but during COVID, only 31% of, of, uh, of authors are male, white male, and then 27% uh, are female. But so it's just like really, really low numbers, very, really terrible numbers. So we need to change that. We need to have diversity, the first thing. And the second thing is also to embrace our heritage, right? And so what does it mean? It means also looking at other ways of knowing, indigenous, indigenous knowledge, right? Um, acknowledging that there are other ways of looking at things. Um, and so I think, I think these two points would be very critical moving forward. I mean, it's already happening. It's not, and it's not uniform across continents, though. This is critical, and I, and I know there is some small but effort 
that is done by individual. So, so I met this, this lady who created a publishing house in Africa because she needs to amplify the stories of the continent and rather than others come and tell, say the stories. Uh, but that, that's, a, that's a fascinating uh, topic on itself. Reform. Dream about how do, how do we fix you know, so the I'm state of education. So I'm going to share with you one thing for little children and one thing for older children. Fundamentally, everyone needs to know, have, to, have literacy and numeracy. And one way that that comes about is by play. Children, especially young children, they need to play because that gives them a chance to interact with other people. It's their base of preparing their brains for literacy and numeracy. I'll never forget being at an early childhood development center a few months ago, and there was a little boy, two or three years old. You know these white plastic chairs that you know, we use everywhere? You can stack them inside each other? Well, these were the little kid versions of them. And he kept trying to stack these little chairs inside of each other, doing three, four, five, as many as he could, you know, until they were here on him. We looked at him and we laughed about, he's the little engineer because he was maneuvering them, he was trying to figure out how this chair leg goes in that space, moving it around. He was basically doing an early form of engineering, right? Of, of spatial understanding. So fundamentally, children need to play, they need learning, literacy, they need numeracy. But for the older ones, when you talk to companies, they very often come back and they ask about analytical thinking and initiative. And so our, our school systems, and this is challenging because the teachers didn't grow up with being, being encouraged to think analytically and to question. Um, but we've got to find a way of encouraging children to question, to come up with new ideas, to tear things apart and then put them back together in a different way or put together something totally different with those pieces, right? And also, and this is sometimes culturally challenging depending on where one is, but it's, it's still important to do it respectfully, of course. Companies are asking for people who don't just sit back and are told what to do, but who come up with ideas, who take initiative. Those are the people who rise through the ranks, right? Not the ones who just sit back and wait for instructions. So we need to encourage young people to come up with ideas, to put them on the table, respectfully, of course. It's not always about a revolution, um, but, these are, but these are really important qualities that companies are looking for and that not just schools, but also civil society organizations, churches, mosques, et cetera, can find ways to cultivate. Yeah, learning through play is definitely you know, a, a successful uh, recipe uh, for, you know, just, just their curiosity. Any, anything related to the 21st century skills, anything is needed. Uh, do you want to? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'd, I'd actually like to build off of what uh, Julian said to answer your uh, point because I know I said I don't agree with your whole TikTok I was quiet. thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think what I mean to say by that is uh, because of a lot of young people who are thinking outside the box already. The, the parameters for success are so wild that for a 20 year old today, you know, what does being successful mean or what does going ahead in life mean? What does accomplishing something mean? The answers to that are at least, you know, that list is 10 times longer than it would have been even five years ago. And that's, that's another critical part of, I don't know, future education or whatever, because maybe they think of becoming an influencer or whatever. And those words meant nothing even as, as early as like five years ago. So I, I think that's, that's what I've, I didn't want to sort of throw shade or whatever, but just, just saying that um, it's, I, I think that children are already doing that, young people are already doing that in terms of having a much broader sense of what success means, what learning means, what accomplishment means, and uh, how to tie that to that. I don't take that as a critic, but as an amendment. Thank this, you. Is this is constructive, yeah. <laughs> Many kids, they're learning now online. All right, so how do we fix the issue? Because we still, in, in a way, we still have a very traditional mm. learning systems, right? And many people go to school because they need that piece of paper. However, that piece of paper is completely disconnected from the reality, mm. right? And in the same time, you have you have what is, you know, could be much more linked to the employment, to the reality of the market, to, to even initiatives such as the global citizenship or, or environment. How do we, how do we, you know, how do we 
bring this together in harmony? And, and how, we, how do we push forward that, you know, the education system, unfortunately, is not paying off anymore, but we should make sure that whatever initiative out there is, is embedded into the system. It, it, it's an open question. We, we still have a few minutes left, so, so let's just, yeah, let's just jump. We need a bit of energy in the room. Come on, come on. <laughs> Juliana. <laughs> Sure, so I think it, it comes down at the end of the day to, to the skills that kids have. The, you know the, the TMIS system of testing across all different countries to get a sense of whether kids can read or write or do arithmetic at the same level. And it, if you don't necessarily have a diploma from your country, but big picture, macro level, if we have a sense of the extent to which kids are doing well on those tests, then it gives us a sense of where we need to improve, what we need to work on even more. Ms. Kriti? Okay. Uh, I think with respect to accreditation, I have no uh, background whatsoever. I just want to hear your opinion. You, do, you must have a view. I have many opinions, <laughs> yes. But uh, I think uh, for me personally, what, what really, if I, if I look back at my education and look at the pieces Would you that hire someone in your company that don't have the regular diploma? We have already. We've right. had many people so who don't tell, have degrees Tell us diploma. why that's, that is important. Here we go. <laughs> well, because I, uh, even the traditional sort of, uh, you know, looking for candidates thing, the, the resume process, it's, it's all flawed. It all boils down to whether you have the skills to do the job. So at Thinkable Labs, how we hire people is we have tasks. And yes, you, you do send in your resume, but it's more sort of to know where you're from and things like that, not really as a proof of work. So for us, proof of work is actually executing the work. And uh, that's how we hire. We actually give people tasks that they would be expected to perform. And um, if they do it, great. And I, I don't care about your degree. Uh, there are quite a few people in the company that didn't have degrees. And uh, it's, it's not a problem, honestly. And it's not a problem for me. And I, I know that I'm not in the minority at all. Uh, tons of friends, at least in the Indian startup ecosystem, you, your degree is possibly the least interesting thing about you. Andres, yeah. I like that modern thinking, uh, and I would go, I would jump on that. But if you want to work in European Union yes, in a public administration, then it's finito. You have to have a degree. A master's degree and a PhD. And, yeah. Doctorate, I think that's. <laughs> Erliani, I know this is a bit far away from your area of expertise, but but w w would you like to share anything about you know the challenges we're facing, the you know between the classic versus you know futuristic <laughs> accreditation type. I mean, we did a bit of accreditation work with the government, but, but I think it's always difficult because you have to have this mutual recognition agreements and it's very technical. But I, I think, I think if, if, if we can change that way, that way of thinking, actually look at what a proof of, proof of work means and what it means uh, to where we employ and hire and have an open hiring practice that, that happens in the US, for example, there's people who do that because they'll make sure there's opportunities for people who are formerly incarcerated, for, for instance. I think it will open doors for many people uh, who are marginalized, who come from broken, with broken histories. So I think there is definitely um, a necessity to do that. Yeah. Terrific. We're, we're almost close to the end. I'm going to take a few questions from the room. And uh, yeah, we have five, six minutes. I'll, uh, so yeah, so we have, I'll take all the four questions. There's four hands or five now. I'll start with you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Elias. Uh, a question for uh, our uh, co-founder from India. Uh, you know, we've, as Juliana very rightly mentioned, human interaction, especially at a very young age in schools, is very important. How do you foresee that translating into ed tech? So in, when we went to school, you'd go to the playground, play with other kids. Uh, how is that translating, or how do you envisage that translating in the technology space? And uh, one question uh, for each of the panelists, if uh, just as a, as a thought experiment, if there's one thing you think that uh, a 15 year old in school should be learning, but is not, what would that be? Should, should we take a yeah, okay. Yeah, Thanks. Yes. My name is Emmanuel from Ghana. Thank you very much for the interesting discussions. Julian, I like what you said about, you know, teaching kids about questioning. And you know, in Africa, I'm sure you already know, yeah. even for us, me, I can't even question my father. I Imagine my surprise when I was studying in Germany and I had a colleague telling the lecturer that he's wrong. 
I was shocked. I can't do that here. So how can, you, how can we do that here you know, in Africa? And then, uh, Elias, I think you mentioned about reforms and you know, uh, providing young people with skills. Now there is, you know, the big problem for young people is, is, is unemployment. And not everyone can be an entrepreneur. I mean, you need to be a risk taker, you need to have the hats. And so this whole idea about encouraging young people to be an entrepreneur, do you think is the right way uh, to go? And then, uh, Elian, I, I think that you should write a book because your story is inspiring from a child already have. To, uh, to have it. Oh, you already have? Then I want a copy. Yeah, so that you, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> we talk later. Get your autograph. Well. All right. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, m my question is on how much we are fascinated about uh, education and linking it to employment. Mm. And uh, not thinking about education as in a form of transmission of knowledge as good in itself. Uh, and, and because when you're talking of uh, education for someone who is young today, 5, 10, 15 years, that education, you don't know what kind of jobs would be there in 15 years to come and 20 years to come. Thank you. Uh, Elias, I'm Jabal, and my question is for you. After you became the moderator, I can see the grin because you thought you escaped the grilling, so we're not done yet. So my question is for you. So, so really from 1985, uh, we've had seen international intervention in youth policies. We had uh, 1993 in Potsdam, uh, uh, 1995 WPAY, and 1998 in Lisbon. And just 10 years between 2008 and 2009 and 2018, we celebrated the African Decade of Youth. Yet, yet, 8% of the children worldwide cannot go to school because they are poor. 19% in Sub-Saharan Africa. Are our policies really having the kind of legs? Are they strong enough? Or do we need to reimagine and rethink? 30 years, 1985 till now, 15 and 20 to 35 years? Where are we? And that, that's my question for you. Right, we'll, we'll talk about it after you and I. But well, let's start the first question uh, to Sanskriti, and then uh, Juliana, and then Erica, and, and then if, if you want to add any, any, anything to, to, to close the, the panel. Yeah, I think, uh, so your question was, uh, how does technology compete versus, you know, children getting FaceTime with other children and teachers and things like that, right? I act, again, I don't think it's an either or, uh, because, so I'll, I'll tell you a story. Last month, I was um, in this district called Mehsana in Gujarat, uh, and I was uh, talking to the inclusive education coordinator there. And they have these uh, WhatsApp groups that they've set up in, across all the blocks of that district, where uh, the teachers are supposed to post whether, they're, uh, whether they've visited the student and whether they've spent time with them. Uh, because again, this is special needs uh, education. So accountability is key in ensuring that children get access because uh, again, this teaching is happening at home. So the teacher is visiting the child's house and you know having that one or two hours of lessons or whatever. And the way that accountability is maintained is through technology. And so it's not an either or saying, oh, do you get FaceTime or do you get technology? No, technology is what enables you to do your job better. And if FaceTime is a part of the job, then it's going to make that better and more robust and more scalable. And yeah, I don't think it's an either or at all. Technology is a great enabler of whatever it is that you want to do with it. I love his question from Ghana because um, I was born in Tunisia, I grew up in Montreal and when we, when we immigrated to Canada, I had the same shock. So yeah, I'd love to hear your experience. No, it's, it's a very relevant question. I lived in Ghana four years and in four other countries on the continent in addition to Ghana and Rwanda, which is why I said with respect, etc. You know, it is possible to change culture. Um, when, I, when I think about what I've read about the, the US or Europe 100 years ago, the mantra was children should be seen and not heard. And things have changed over time. Um, so I think it takes people setting the example, slowly, slowly, whether it's within a company or within a school or within a family, it takes the, f the few people beginning to say to the children, it's okay, you can question me, and show that they're not going to be beaten, they're not going to, to be criticized. Um, and there are actually programs here, just here in Rwanda, um, the African Leadership University, um, which has a connection actually with its founder, Tagana, really stimulates young people to, to ask these questions and be critical. There's another program here called uh, Bridge to Rwanda 
that prepares young people to go to university in particularly in the United States because that's where they have links. And they, but they don't, which might be what happened to you, they don't just throw them in cold. They give them a whole year of orientation of, of training, so to speak, to help them realize that, for example, when they get into the US university, they don't stand up when they speak. <laughs> you know, so, but then these kids go to the US and they excel. Mm -hmm. And these are kids who come, when they come to this training program, they're reading it, you know, on a not at grade level, but they bring them up to grade level. They give them orientation. So totally acknowledge that it's not easy um, and it takes time. It's it's a process. But the, there are African companies that are asking for kids who are more critical, who are more who take more initiative. So it's then I think up to these companies also to set the example. So I hope that helps a bit. Very good question. As this, you come from Ghana, there's a lot of amazing, Ashesi University, yes, Patrick exactly. is doing some fantastic, yep, fantastic. work here. So, so they are, they are you know, there's a movement, it, it just takes time. Mm -hmm. We have to be patient with the outcome of education. Yeah, I just want to bridge two of your questions together here in the middle. You're asking what a 15 year old should learn and, and know, and you were acknowledging that we need to also use education to transmit values and culture. I think this is really, really spot on. Like for me, a 15 year old should also be, um, be taught to appreciate his or her, or her culture. And I talked about that earlier, indigenous ways of knowing, storytelling. So things that we don't normally see in schools. And for example, it took me a long time to even acknowledge that I'm from an indigenous community, a Malay community, and we have our own traditions of storytelling and, and oral history. And it took me so many, because, because my former, you know, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew was always looking to the West. But now I'm, at this time, this age, I'm embracing my heritage. It took me so long. Our youth should start with that cultural acknowledgement and, and, val and valuing it young, like start young, start now. Excellent, I think um, we, we can close on these beautiful remarks. Uh, that was a, a great pleasure having uh, this uh, panelist and uh, let's, let's just go enjoy some, some dinner and, and keep up the conversation uh, with, with a good dinner. Thank you very much everyone.